So this video looks at uh, continuing our discussions about media regulation in Australia uh, as part of our uh, agency and control area of study for VCE Media Unit 4. Um, we have previously looked at uh, the rationale for regulating the media as well as touched on a couple of issues or challenges that um, government regulation proposes. Uh, what we now look at is more specifically how uh, government regulation works in the form of the Australian Classification Board. Um, when looking at this, we'll also touch on a couple of case studies that highlight perhaps some of the strengths and weaknesses of uh, both this particular type of regulation as well as the overall uh, nature of government regulation. So the classification board decides on what classification or otherwise known as rating to give every film, DVD and computer video game in Australia as well as some literature. Uh, this is done so that adults can make informed choices about the content that they choose to watch or what they let their children watch. Uh, some classifications uh, restrict the access to people over a certain age uh, and then others are just advisory to let people know what might be in um, the content of uh, films and video games that uh, audiences consume. And while uh, this is an independent body, uh, the classification board is still overseen by the Australian federal government and it ultimately answers to ACMA um, and then their figurehead is the federal attorney general who is a, um, a politician, a member of parliament elected by the people. So it, it's really... Um, necessary to clear up that classification is not the same as censorship. So when you are writing about the classification board um, or government regulation in Australia, um, do make sure that you're not talking about censorship. Uh, many countries such as New Zealand do censor their media. Um, what censorship means is that if there is a film with a particular scene um, or certain shots or images or even language that the government decides is inappropriate, um, they will remove that. Um, Australia doesn't do this. So um, an example of censorship is if you're watching a film and swear words are bleeped out, um, that would be censorship because it's an outside body, a regulatory body, um, actually changing the content themselves. Instead, in Australia, the classification board um, simply, simply advises on what content is in that film, so they don't actually change the product itself. Uh, the classification board is made up of around 20 people um, who are supposed to represent all of Australia. Um, if you were to look at the classification board members, um, you would actually see that um, they don't necessarily represent the uh, cultural, um, religious or age um, diversity of Australia. Instead, they're typically made up of um, middle class, well-educated, ed typically white uh, people who are based in Sydney. So think about how um, if a group of 20 people um, all from a similar demographic based in Sydney are meant to represent um, individuals and communities from, let's say, a remote community in Western Australia or a um, Greek community in Melbourne. Um, the way that the board works is in teams of about three, um, members will watch a film or will play um, snippets of a game um, and they will decide on the classification allocated by majority vote. When thinking about uh, classifying films or video games, there are six elements that uh, that particular game or film is assessed on. Uh, you probably know these from looking at um, classifications on the films that you consume. So these six things are coarse language, violence, drug use, adult themes, nudity, and sex. So on each of those six categories, um, a, 
uh, a panel will actually watch a film and will tick a box as to whether it um, has a high impact or low impact or anywhere in between. So this assessed impact or just how severe each um, classifiable element um, is present in the film determines the classification category that the board allocates. Uh, so you, you will probably be familiar with these uh, classification categories. Um, if the, something has a very mild impact, it's considered to be G-rated. A mild impact has PG. Moderate impact is rated M. Strong impact gets an MA restrictive rating. A high impact gets an R18 plus restrictive rating. And then if there is a high impact for sexually explicit content, um, which we would probably classify as pornography, um, we do in Australia have an X rating, which is just for that pornographic material. The ones on the left there are known as advisory categories. Um, these are not um, restricted by age. So uh, even though M-rated material is meant to be recommended for mature audiences, a five-year-old could still watch it. Those on the right are restricted categories. So by law, if you are 14 years old, you cannot watch an MA 15 plus restricted film. Okay, you must be of the age of 15. Now, uh, movie theaters and um, uh, JB Hi-Fi or any kind of DVD retailer cannot sell tickets to or DVDs um, for restricted category films or games to people under that age. The result is quite a significant fine. Finally, in Australia, although we do not censor, uh, the classification board may refuse classification to a film or video game. Now, when a um, film or game is refused classification, it cannot be sold, hired, or even advertised in Australia because of its extremely and excessively high impact. Um, when we are talking about this, we, we often call these uh, banned films, but the correct terminology is refuse classification. So again, if there is a really particularly offensive scene in a film, the classification board will not uh, remove that scene themselves. They might respond to the filmmakers and say, um, your film uh, is refused classification because of the excessive violence or sex or whatever it might be in this particular scene. And then it might be up to the filmmakers to decide whether they themselves uh, remove that offending scene so that the, um, the product can still be released and distributed in Australia. So a couple of uh, case studies uh, to look at in terms of how the classification board works and some pros and cons that come out of them. We can look at E.T. the Extraterrestrial, which was a film from 1982, and it was originally classified with a G rating for um, its 1982 release. So all audiences can see it. It was considered to have very mild impact. However, any changes to a film means that it has to be resubmitted to the classification board. So for 20 years, uh, this film continued to be classified as G-rated, so anybody could watch it. However, in 2002, the 20th anniversary DVD was resubmitted um, because of a couple of changes uh, to the actual film, and it was uh, instead given a PG rating for medium level course language and supernatural themes. Um, this change was meant to reflect the shift in Australian society's attitudes. Um, if you were to re-watch um, ET and think about whether it is appropriate for a four-year-old, say, um, there are a few sort of scary scenes um, and there, there is a bit of language that may be inappropriate. Some parents uh, might not choose to let their child watch that. Um, of course, uh, the irony here is that the film was resubmitted because the filmmakers tried to actually make it more child friendly. Um, the way in which they did that is in the original film, uh, all the police officers held uh, guns and weapons. Um, 
instead the filmmakers thought, okay, that's actually a little bit scary for, for young children, especially when um, the things that they're holding guns against is the friendly alien ET. Um, so using CGI, they actually removed those weapons and replaced them with walkie-talkies. Um, if you were to re-watch the uh, 20th anniversary version, it is quite amusing to see um, law enforcement running around actually holding walkie-talkies as if they are guns. Um, but the filmmakers thought, look, we're going to make this more appropriate for children. But because Australian society had changed in terms of um, how much uh, protection we think children deserve when it comes to the media, um, it was still given a higher advisory category of PG. A second example to look at is um, a film called Ken Park. And um, I'm, while this film itself um, is extremely excessive in terms of its depiction of uh, sex and violence and particularly sexual violence. Um, a group of uh, people decided that um, they would ignore the classification board's original decision to ban Ken Park or refuse classification of Ken Park. And so you can see here they put together a bit of a screening of the film uh, where they said that, um, you know, a mature, um, able-minded adults could make the decision to actually watch that film themselves. And it was a bit of a backlash against um, the classification board refusing classification of this film. So this occurred in 2002 where Ken Park was refused classification due to the high impact of violent, uh, often non-consensual and glorified non-consensual sex scenes. So it depicted um, sexual violence in a way that um, was actually glorified in the film or, or so the classification board ruled. Um, however, a group decided to screen that film, uh, including prominent Australian film figures like Margaret Pomerantz. Um, the police showed up um, because this, this screening was known to the police, um, and knowing that the film could not be screened legally in Australia, uh, they asked for the organisers to hand over the DVD. The organisers agreed to, um, to not screen it anymore, but didn't hand over the film reels. Um, and then once the police left, the organisers just screened it anyway. The police returned um, uh, very quickly and turned the power off and arrested the organisers for screening a refused classification film to Australian audiences. So this highlights that um, for traditional media, the classification board, it, the, the system works. Um, the organisers were arrested, that they broke um, the, the law, and so they were arrested. Um, the film was not screened, and so therefore Australian audiences um, did not um, consume this refused classification or this banned film. And still to this day, the film is banned in Australia. Um, it can't be sold or screened uh, anywhere. There will still be uh, significant fines and arrests for any organisations that do um, uh, distribute the film. However, because we are now in a world with contemporary media, Ken Park is available on YouTube. Um, it, took me only a simple YouTube search of Ken Park for movie um, to come up with four uh, options to watch the movie in its entirety. Now, um, knowing that it is illegal to, um, to screen this film, um, I did not click on any of the links, um, but you can see how easy it is to bypass um, the regulation of traditional media such as film in a contemporary media society. This is just on YouTube itself, and yep, it is, you can see up there, it is YouTube Australia. I didn't use a VPN, um, but it also shows that uh, um, users 
online can easily apply a VPN to access material from um, another country. Um, perhaps they would use some uh, pirating uh, torrent services um, to access material that has been refused classification. And now, unlike um, screening it in a theatre where the police know um, what's going on, it is really hard to police what people do in their own homes behind closed doors. And so this raises a big issue or challenge to the way in which governments regulate the media. So what are the uh, pros and cons or the strengths and weaknesses of government regulation when we're looking at the classification board in particular? Well, a strength is that it does have the authority um, to offer uh, penalise people with fines and arrests. So the fact that um, government regulation is law, is legally binding, um, that is a particular strength of it. Um, there is a, a, a real incentive there um, for people to do the right thing so that they're not punished uh, through fines or arrests. Another strength of the classification board in particular is that every single film and game is checked before it's released to the public. Um, by checking every single thing um, and before people consume it, it means that there is that consistency there in, in the rulings and in their classifications. Um, that you can know with confidence what an MA rated film will contain that is worse than a um, M rated film. Um, by classifying things before it's released to the public, it also gives that audience um, their, I guess, informed consent as to what they choose to watch. So when you see the label as something rated, let's say uh, M, if you're an adult and you're deciding on whether your uh, 12 year old child should actually see that, you might decide that, okay, well, if it's just got supernatural themes, that's okay, my kid's not a scaredy cat. However, if it does have a little bit of um, violence and sex in it, maybe I'm not comfortable with my 12 year old watching that. So um, the classifications um, being present before people consume it um, gives people that sort of uh, informed choice. Um, another strength is that the media is not involved. Therefore, um, decisions are not biased. Um, if we think about the ET example, well, the um, producers of the film actually wanted it to be available to all audiences. So I'm sure in their heads, they would want that to be a G-rated film. However, um, taking out that sort of uh, financial incentive of having a broader audience means that the, um, the government can actually assign a fair rating to it. Uh, finally, a strength is that the board is supposedly made up of Australian um, regular everyday citizens of Australia, um, and therefore it should reflect Australian values. However, there are some significant weaknesses. Um, the main one being is that it is difficult to police in a contemporary media landscape where um, people, users, audiences are online. Um, it is a system of regulation that is much better suited to the broadcast era uh, previously. A weakness is even though every film is checked before it's released, that means it's really slow to act. So when uh, something is uh, released in what is now a fast paced, immediate, globalised media landscape, um, the classification board is sort of clunky in that they have to watch that film, they have to classify it, they have to have that classification uh, attached to that film in terms of posters, DVD covers, etc. before it's released. And that takes up time before audiences actually can consume what perhaps is being consumed in other countries around the world. Finally, a weakness is that the board itself is criticised for not representing the diverse range of Australian citizens, being that it is based in Sydney um, and it, it's comprised of mostly well-educated, middle-class, often white uh, members. So we can see here, um, particularly that Ken Park example, highlights something from the study design. Um, as the media increasingly crosses national borders, governments struggle to maintain control over laws and policies created for their jurisdictions. So it was very easy, easy previously 
to stop people from watching uh, Ken Park as a film. It was very easy to stop um, the importation of film reels or DVDs of Ken Park. Um, however, it is a, a real struggle to maintain that same control in an online global immediate contemporary media landscape. Um, one way in which um, governments try to regulate the online space is through geo-blocking. Now, geo-blocking is a term uh, that means it, it's a limitation on the distribution of web-based media to geographic regions such as uh, certain nations or um, or continents. Uh, this typically occurs because of re regional ownership and distribution agreements. So what's available on Netflix or YouTube in the USA may not be available here in Australia. Um, a, a simple example of this is Friends is available on US Netflix, but it is not on Australian Netflix. The reason behind this is because Channel 9 and Foxtel have paid for the rights to distribute Friends locally. And so uh, Netflix cannot just go and uh, scream Friends on uh, their Australian uh, network because Foxtel and 9 own those rights. Um, this can be a challenge as well. As we mentioned before, individuals can easily use a VPN to bypass firewalls and access geoblock content. So uh, for those of you with um, a VPN at home, you just click a button and it, it pretends that your computer exists in the USA, for example. And then therefore, when you just type in netflix.com, you do not get the Australian version, you get the United States version um, where friends would be available to you. This can be a problem because um, Foxtel and Channel 9 are Australian companies. Um, we as Australian citizens do want to support our, our local media industry. And so if we are bypassing um, that industry, it means uh, less money for them um, through advertisers um, and more money to uh, directly to the USA. So um, another way in which the government tries to regulate material in Australia is through local content quotas. We mentioned this previously as part of our rationale for regulating the media. Um, some of the rules in Australia that are imposed on commercial television networks are that 55% of local content must be aired between 6 a.m. and midnight. So when you start watching television, if you're on channels uh, 7, 9 and 10, uh, from 6 a.m. to midnight, more than half of the things that are aired should be Australian. Um, there are also rules about how much children's programming needs to go um, to air and uh, how much first run drama needs to be um, put are, um, both on air as well as it's work, it works with a point system. So it's not just about how many hours are screened each year, but also how many jobs are created, um, how prominent that Australian drama is, is um, placed on the network. Um, so these are laws imposed on um, the traditional broadcast media in Australia. However, uh, streaming video on demand services like Netflix and Stan are not subjected to the same content quotas. Um, and although Stan produces some original content like the cop comedy, No Activity, uh, Netflix uh, has produced just one Australian Netflix original. Uh, it's called Tidelands. Um, as of uh, August this year, it is not on air yet, but is expected to be on air by the end of 2018. And so even though um, Netflix have an estimated budget of uh, 7 to $8 billion in 2018, and by the end of 2018 should have more than 700 original productions, only one of those is Australian. So this has led to some debate about whether ACMA should actually enforce some similar content quotas on streaming services. Obviously, uh, this is an issue and challenge that is currently being debated, um, and it should be pretty obvious as to uh, which parties would fall on either side. 
Um, just some information before we look at the, the pros and cons of this. Um, Netflix is estimated to have a market penetration of about 30% of Australian households. So um, three out of 10 every houses um, has access and is using Netflix. A study by RMIT in September 2017 found that uh, the Australian content on Netflix amounts to about 2 to 2.5%. Um, that's a really good uh, number to compare to what we said about um, the local content on television networks in Australia. So 55% of uh, all TV between 6am and midnight is meant to be Australian, and yet only 2% uh, of content on Netflix is Australian. Um, there is only one Netflix original called Tidelands, uh, and it's set for release later this year. Um, however, Netflix do um, have a partnership with the ABC, where they have contributed financially to productions such as Glitch, Pine Gap, and The Investigators. So when uh, this content quota debate uh, has come up and it's still currently happening. Um, on the side four uh, content quotas for Netflix, uh, in September 2017, various uh, Australian media industry associations combined to launch the Make It Australian campaign. And this was a lobby to push government to require Netflix to spend 10% of its Australian revenue uh, on Australian programming. So that's just for every um, for every hundred dollars that um, Netflix makes off Australian subscribers, um, this group is saying ten dollars should go into producing um, original Australian content. Um, one of the things that the Make It Australian campaign said is that federal politicians are the custodians of Australian screen stories. They must act now to ensure that existing Australian content rules, so those apply to um, television networks and Foxtel, um, are first preserved. And then on top of that, these rules should be extended to cover SVOD services, such as Netflix and Stan. On the flip side of that, um, Netflix insists that um, these kind of rules actually cause more harm than good um, and can lead to things like a low quality programming. So um, Reed Hastings, the CEO of Netflix said that quotas are well intentioned, uh, but like most things, the regulations often backfire. Uh, the CEO of Stan has also said that quotas would only serve to stifle innovation and creativity. Um, so one thing that uh, this debate in Australia um, is it's actually a little bit behind the rest of the world. Um, once again, the European Union is ahead of Australia here in dealing with this issue. So in April of 2018, um, the EU Parliament voted to impose a 30% local content quota on Netflix, um, Amazon Prime and, and any other SVOD services. Um, by law, they have said that there will be penalty taxes if a streaming service like Netflix fails to meet those quotas. So what Australians are suggesting is actually significantly lower to what Netflix already needs, is already required to do in Europe. So what's the um, good side and the bad side to this? Well, um, a pro or a, um, a positive of having local content quotas is that it supports local media industry jobs um, where uh, Netflix and Stan and streaming giants are actually taking away audiences from traditional media. Well, that actually means that the television networks have less money to spend on um, local productions, which means that, well, where are those jobs going to go? Well, if there was a content quota on Netflix, then those jobs could trans um, transform over to there. Um, another positive of a local content quota is that it prom promotes and maintains Australian stories, as well as the representation of national identity. We said in our rationale for regulation, that is one of the key points. So this law would promote that. Um, children's programming um, also ensures that Australian kids aren't um, influenced too much to, uh, by American content. Um, there is a fear that our uh, Australian kids are losing um, 
their sense of Australian identity because the media content that they consume is so heavily Americanized. On the flip side, um, the main um, negative of a local content quota is that it can result in low quality content. Um, so a streaming service like Netflix, if they just have to um, create content to a certain percentage, then in order to tick that box, they might just produce um, low quality material uh, instead. We can see this on our television networks where in order to reach that 55% um, local content between 6 a.m. and midnight, um, it's often comp comprised by uh, something like today in the morning um, or sunrise, which takes up three hours of the morning, as well as those morning shows, which are mostly infomercials anyway, really, really cheaply made. Um, and then when we think what's next, okay, so there's a morning bulletin of news, there's an afternoon bulletin of news, there's the evening bulletin of news, there is the late night bulletin of news, and then in between those in the afternoon, you might have some children's programming, you might have a couple of cheaply made game shows, and then in the evening, um, instead of having sort of high quality drama, um, you might have some sort of uh, reality TV show um, where Love Island Australia, even though it's Australian made, it doesn't necessarily promote an Australian story or a representation of national identity. Um, so by doing these cheaply made things, we're actually not necessarily ticking all the boxes in terms of the reasons why we should have um, local content. So Netflix sort of says that if, if you're just imposing these rules, we're just going to do it to tick the box. Instead, let it be free and open and we will produce high quality material that is appealing to audiences. Um, finally, um, by having just the amount of um, a percentage of uh, revenue allocated to Australian dramas, it might result in more Australian productions, but because Netflix uh, is meant to be distributing things for a global audience, it might not actually be willing to produce Australian stories. Instead, it might be producing stories that appeal to a global audience and just filmed in Australia. So again, it may not tick that box of promoting a national identity. And so by looking at these um, examples of how the classification board has worked and how local content is currently um, being debated in terms of Netflix, you can see that the way in which government regulation works in Australia um, has previously been a really positive thing, but in a contemporary media landscape actually faces some significant challenges. In the next video, we are going to look at how self-regulation works um, and the issues and challenges that are raised with that.